Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. This week, we are continuing our more frequent coverage of the impacts of COVID-19 on the Horn of Africa. I'm especially delighted to welcome today's guest, Kenyan diplomat Ambassador Maboub Malim. For over a decade, from 2008 to 2019, Ambassador Malim served as the Executive Secretary of IGAD, the Horn of Africa's regional bloc. And he's here today to talk about how the virus is impacting diplomacy throughout the region, and if and how the region can muster a collective response to this pandemic. Ambassador, thanks for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. It's a privilege uh, to, to be invited and to take part in this discussion. Ambassador, you know this region inside and out, so I'm wondering how vulnerable you see the Horn of Africa is right now to this pandemic, both from a public health perspective, but also politically. Uh, I, I see this region as, uh, at this point in time, uh, having its uh, already existing vulnerability uh, much more upscale than it was before. And I talk about before because this region has always had uh, very many uh, emergency related, particularly water, weather related emergencies all the time and some diseases. So really this time, I think we are definitely worried and concerned. And I think uh, the vulnerability is definitely uh, being tested. Right now, like we mentioned, uh, and as everyone I think is is painfully aware in the context of the Horn of Africa, is that the disease poses not just a threat from a public health perspective, but also a political perspective. I'm wondering, uh, when you scan around the region, what worries you the most in terms of the potential political effects of this virus? Yes, uh, you're right. This, this virus has, uh, has, diff- has uh, serious governance and security and, and also, of course, uh, political implication. Uh, the first one I can think about is uh, the disruption of uh, you know, the de- democratic systems that I see uh, developing in our region. Uh, for example, there is already a country like Ethiopia uh, that has taken the cue, uh, and rightfully so, in uh, postponing the elections, for example. And I'm sure it's just a question of time. Uh, a lot of discussions is going on in Somalia. I have not been privy to it, but I do know differently that we are talking about it. We, we probably will see uh, Somalia following suit. Uh, this, of, this dispensation, of course, is... Uh, is, is uh, uh, we encourage such a, such a dispensation... Uh, due to the disease, but you see, you can imagine the uh, the um, lack of clear understanding of the timelines. If, if that is if that's uh, questioned and it becomes uh, something that uh, disrupts uh, social order uh, in future, uh, would be something that probably would uh, would, would would have serious uh, political implications in future. For example, uh, so these things are, of course, things that are direct results of political implications and regional stability for for the disease. But also, there is, we also see uh, uh, disruption of some critical diplomatic uh, efforts in the region. Uh, for example, recently there was a, a trilateral summit that was supposed to take place between Kenya, Ethiopia, and Somalia. So, so that trilateral summit summit was cancelled, was, was suspended rather, uh, because of the disease. So this is something that I see also uh, will continue repeating itself along other fronts that require high-level consultations, which is not taking place right now because of the disease. But also our own governments becoming uh, inward-looking. Uh, governments uh, have their hands full and everything's about internal issues and about discussions and about curfew and about arrests for those who break it and about uh, what's going to happen to people. So a lot of uh, multilateral and uh, bilateral discussions uh, that, that, that goes on every day, and that's important for countries to politically stay stable is being undermined. EGAD, you know, as you mentioned, tried to find a way of continuing to, to work at a summit level uh, despite the restrictions um, and all the inward facing that you've uh, mentioned. Um, I think, you know, one of the stark things about this virus is that, it's, uh, uh, is that it appears to, to really isolate um, people from each other, but also countries from each other, even though it's it's obviously a threat that all of humanity faces collectively. You know, we see countries shut down, leaders can't meet in person, borders close. 
I'm wondering what you think regional blocks like EGAD can realistically do to address this challenge. Um, it seems like it seems like the 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 virus is threatening, you know, not just lives, but also in a certain way the multilateral institutions that were set up to deal with crises like these. And you hear some more hopeful voices saying maybe this crisis could bring countries together because it's something we all face collectively. But but how? Okay, well, here there are two issues here. There's of course the uh, the regional component, which I'm sure is what you want me to address, but also there are in-country uh, programs. There are two sets of this in the region. One is, of course, the vulnerable groups. And there is, in my view, uh, a very uh, uh, you know, comprehensive contingency systems that exist that can be used, that can act as uh, shelf plans that can be operationalized uh, any minute, that, that some of the operationalization, operationalization has been going on. And also, and as far as the... Um, over and above this framework, uh, th- there's also been, um, and this was as a result of the emergencies that we've had before, which was mainly weather-related, we have a very uh, comprehensive resilience agenda uh, in the region. It's called IDDRSI, EGAD, Drought and Disaster Resilience and Sustainability Initiative. Uh, this has been going on for a while. Um, I'm sure, uh, looking at the heads of state's recent uh, summit, uh, a little, a little bit of um, uh, you know um, retuning on some of the ongoing programs would address uh, some of the issues that are required to be to be addressed in the in the, in the COVID uh, crisis. But also recently, last year, towards the end of last year, a 10 billion US dollar program was uh, launched uh, through membership by the countries, the EU, the African Development Bank, and the, and the World Bank. And here again, that means there is already a pot of funds that can be called on, uh, can be called upon, uh, that I think also would, would at this time differently be able to be available uh, on a faster basis than it would be before. But also, uh, as a framework of, of using these funds and on running on what people require to be assisted with, there are existing cross-border programs already uh, ongoing in about six, co- six or seven cross-border uh, programs that are up and running in the Iga region. So those are the places that require uh, to be used as a launching pads. The money, I think, is available. The framework is available for both groups. So I think this is something that requires uh, a special uh, uh, trigger. And I think the trigger now is already there through the heads of state's uh, recent consultation. So I think we have the systems to go. We are lucky we have had these mechanisms put in place a long time ago, and they seem to be paying uh, dividends now. Do you have thoughts on how can the region protect refugees um, as well as the other uh, displaced populations affected by conflict? Because, of course, as you mentioned, these these populations, they live in very close quarters and already very, very vulnerable to, to this disease. So ha- have you heard conversations within the region about specifically how, how they can try to prevent the spread to these camps, but also what would happen if, if an outbreak occurred in one of these refugee camps or IDP camps? Of course, as I said, I, I have left IGAD now, so really I'm not in the middle of this, but I do know, uh, I, I do know that there they, they, they is definitely a consideration on uh, the social impact of uh, of the disease, the overcrowding in the in the in the slum areas and in the refugees and uh, refugee camps, for example, and then definitely look at the issue of water. Uh, I'm sure there's there's there need to upgrade the wash, water and sanitation systems in uh, those those areas. Uh, and then uh, within the camps, there are also vulnerable groups like children and women and children and uh, and and the, and the disabled. Uh, look at what specifically can be done. Uh, to address those groups, to make it much more better for them to live through this uh, difficult time. Uh, there's, a, there's already um, an understanding that several uh, children who already have the disease, one of them was announced to, to have died in Nairobi yesterday, and the doctors were talking about the fact that ha- had, had the child had a proper maternal child health care before, uh, probably the child would survive. So how can we upgrade some of the health facilities now so that if for those who get the disease to prevent, but if those who get them, they, they are a bit more, the chances for them to be, uh, to, to be stronger, to survive with is higher. So there's a couple of things that uh, people on the ground can look at and, uh, and do 
Great. Now, we, we've mentioned a few times the teleconference summit that, that did occur uh, between EGAD, heads of states, uh, where, they, where they promised to, to formulate a regional response strategy. Um, and um, among the things I think that the region will be, will be focusing on uh, will be trying to coordinate efforts to uh, receive financial assistance, and you've even seen campaigns for debt relief start. What sort of environment do you expect uh, for the Horn of African countries as they approach donors who are facing their own you know, crises from these pandemics at home, and yet will be having uh, many poorer nations around the world coming and, and asking for support? Um, do you, have, you got, have you heard any indication of how, this, how these appeals for funding are likely to go? Well, I, I of course, definitely... Um the declaration talks about um, coordination, which are, which a lot of us take for granted, which is a very difficult thing to do and needs a lot of commitment. It's easier said than done. So that really is very, uh, in my view, is uh, quite promising. Uh, it talks about uh, um, uh, forming uh, a, uh, uh, an emergency fund. And I remember reading that uh, President of Kenya um, already... Uh, pledged uh, support in, the, in that basket. Uh, I also do know, as I said earlier, there are different uh, already financing instruments that are already current, that's ongoing, that's already in the pipeline. I'm curious uh, why you think that we haven't seen more efforts coordinated through some of these multilateral institutions like EGAD, but not only EGAD, the African Union, um, even there's been criticism that the United Nations uh, isn't really leading on this. I think one notable thing was the donation that that came from Jack Ma, the Chinese entrepreneur, where he donated 20,000 test kits and 100,000 masks, I believe, to every African nation. That that was also done not you know really through uh, an institution, but was but was uh, but was largely done through the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Abiy Ahmed. Something that we hear quite a bit is that there, you know, and that we see quite a bit, uh, not just in response to this pandemic, but more broadly is a sort of crisis of multilateralism. Um, and that applies to the region. Also, we've seen a lot of foreign powers uh, choose to to engage with governments directly, often instead of instead of going through some of the multilateral institutions such as EGAD, the African Union. Uh, for instance, we saw a lot of that regarding uh, the Sudanese political transition, where a lot of the efforts uh, were, were were done sort of bilaterally instead of through the region. And it seems like in the course of the response to this pandemic so far, we've sort of seen that accelerated. Um, and I use the I use the Jack Ma donation as an example of where it seems to have gone sort of directly through the head of state um, on the Ethiopian side and then to the countries directly. So uh, the question that um, some of the um, finance agencies or some of the uh, supporting countries talk to specific countries directly, I really do not see it as a, as, as, as a means that bypasses uh, regional mechanisms. Uh, to the contrary, I see it's, an, an, it's a, an, a, an immediate support for an immediate need. However, uh, of course, the, the regional cont- content cannot be uh, bypassed and, and must also be supported. And, and these uh, uh, frameworks and existing finances that I've talked about uh, differently will, will get the, the ball rolling for, for now. Uh, but a lot of the work has to be done in each of the countries as it stands now, just like all other emergencies before, even though we have not seen one with this kind of uh, magnitude uh, ever. Ambassador, one of the one of the questions regarding this crisis that I see, and you mentioned it briefly before, is that essentially face-to-face diplomacy has shut down across the region. You mentioned the tripartite summit between Kenya, Somalia, and Ethiopia that's been delayed. Of course, we've seen some teleconferencing take place um, by video, but in some cases that hasn't been enough. We've seen peace talks in South Sudan with some of these holdout groups who hadn't signed the original peace deal that were taking place in Rome. Those have been basically postponed because because of the challenges of doing some of these peace talks and teleconferencing. I'm just wondering from your deep experience dealing with these with these political negotiations and peace talks, what are the limits to 
to trying to conduct uh, some of these sensitive talks by video instead of face to face. I'm wondering if you think essentially we'll see diplomacy, you know, go through a period of a bit of a deep freeze because some of these sort of sensitive negotiations and peace talks can't really take place. No, I I uh, I, I entirely, entirely agree with you 100 percent that uh, uh, negotiations discussions uh, normally has uh, an up and down. It has its own amplitude. Uh, a lot of times, probably when people sit for a very long time, say eight, nine hours, probably you've only have had uh, an hour or two of uh, uh, beneficial discussions. The rest is either to cool each other or just walk around or call for a break. Uh, so to do the, the negotiations and mediation and to really uh, have people um, understand each other's red lines, uh, you know, on teleconferencing is not easy. And, and that's why I mentioned uh, the fact that, uh, in my view, I think this has uh, disrupted some critical diplomatic uh, efforts. What are some of the other crises or issues in the region that you think will be most affected by this that do require this sort of regional diplomacy? Well, you see, uh, we, we, we had uh, all these successes here and there. For example, the South Sudan issue you just mentioned. Uh, requires uh, some follow-ups. Um, this this cannot be done uh, over 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 teleconferencing. Uh, Sudan is making a lot of progress in its own internal, uh, you know, um, in, internal discussions with with, with the the, the forty and other groups and, and some of the uh, you know how to operationalize uh, some of the decisions so that the the the, the transitional period before the transitional period ends. Uh, and now this is also being supported by, uh, generally by eager member countries that require uh, frequent meetings. I talked to the South Sudan ambassador, eager ambassador of South Sudan last night, and he's sitting, he's also in a lockdown in, uh, in uh, Addis Ababa. Uh, ambassador Guyo, who is our special envoy for Somalia and also the Red, the, the Red Sea of the Gulf, is, is quarantined in a hotel in Nairobi after have, yeah, having come from a uh, trip in Europe. And can't leave that hotel the next 14 days. Uh, so a lot of things that record, this, this invoice should have been uh, moving about now and should, should have been uh, uh, discussing with people and should have had a high level engagements already. So th- none of this is going on. One of the things that you know worries me quite a bit about that, and I imagine worries you as well, is that if we do see political crises that arise, either by themselves or because of this pandemic, the sort of regional peace and security apparatus that's there to to kickstart negotiations might have a hard time kicking in if people are quarantined, if people can't travel, and if we're not able to do face-to-face negotiations. Precisely, precisely, 100%. That's already happening. Uh, for example, the African Union, I was reading a document yesterday where the African Union has a uh, uh, called off all the African Union meetings. Uh, they have postponed the uh, deployment of uh, forces, in, forces in the Sahel, which was almost ready. Uh, they cannot um, do the, tra- the normal uh, uh, replacements for the forces in Darfur. Uh, they can't do what they were supposed to do in AU, I mean in, uh, in, in South Sudan. Uh, IGAD had similar uh, examples. I just mentioned some to you. So you, you, are, you are very right. This is, we are getting into a... Uh, a very, a very dangerous time uh, in our life. Uh, and we have to keep our fingers crossed and become innovative, look at some of the frameworks that exist, how much of that can we... Uh, uh, what, what is there any low-hanging fruit anywhere that we can cling on, for example, and things like those. So we have to really be thinking much different than we ever thought it would be required to do at this time. Yeah, and one thing about a pandemic is that, of course... The entire world will need to work together because even if they get the virus under control in some parts of the world, they'll have to bring the virus under control in all parts of the world to fully end the pandemic. So, of course, although everyone's looking internally now, if you wanted to be hopeful, you could say that the world is you know, ramping up production of ventilators and masks. They're gaining experience how to beat the disease. Um, so if, you know, if African nations can use the benefit of its, of its lag in the outbreak itself to push back its peak far enough, you know, maybe it'll buy enough time for other countries uh, to get their own outbreaks under control, you know, and then we might start to see some of the assistance really flow in uh, if, if, if African nations are not able to avert the outbreak itself, but at least push back its, its peak as far as possible. No, that, that's correct. That's correct. I, I'm sure... 
we are, we are all try we are all learning from what has happened in other places in the world. Uh, we know the dangers involved. Uh, we see some of the serious shortages uh, in, in, in some of the highly required um, items of support required for the disease control right now. It's the same everywhere here in Africa. Um, and therefore, yes, I think uh, the fact that there has been a lag between when it hit here and when it hit elsewhere, uh, that, that's a positive. Uh, it, it plays positively into what our, each of our countries can do, uh, having learned from what has happened elsewhere. But I said at the end of the day, again, a lot of uh, resources required of this. And he, listening to some of the ministers of finance make declarations, I think the country is very serious about uh, what they can do uh, on their own first. Uh, and then look at uh, the, the multilaterals and see what can come uh, from other places so that um, communities and people who ne- no- normally are not, uh, who, who normally uh, slip through the fingers of the planning processes of each of the countries, those who are the border, border towns, for example, and border areas uh, can be reached and can, can also be, uh, can also be um, uh, supported accordingly. Yeah. Now, now one more question since we have you on, which is less related to the pandemic. But of course, given how long you served the region as executive secretary of EGAD, um, I wanted to, to ask you about EGAD's future itself and how you see it. Um, among the discussions that we're part of, and I'm sure that you've been part of, some people in the region see EGAD as sort of losing some of the relevance it used to have. You have, you know, uh, countries in the Horn discussing forming new blocks of countries that would be smaller than EGAD. Um, You have Ethiopia, which for a long time, you know, was the country that led and largely shaped EGAD. Uh, You know, they're no longer chair, and the new prime minister appears less interested in EGAD than his predecessors. I'm wondering... Um, you know, how do you see EGAD's future and do you think regional leaders continue to really back it? Well, I, 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 I actually think that uh, first and foremost, I, I'm sure that if EGAD did not exist today, I'm, I'm pretty sure that somebody would be intelligent enough to, to request that it, it's created. So if it was not here, it would have had to be created. That, that I, can, I can assure you because I, I know what it does, I know what it can do, and I know uh, the number of times it has uh, basically uh, supported each of the country individually and collectively. So I think IGAD uh, is not going to go anywhere. Secondly, there has been a discussion in IGAD uh, while I was there uh, that uh, if we really are talking about a uh, continental free trade area, we're talking about um, you know trade, we're talking about uh, uh, you know common market and issues like those, then there was no reason to have two independent uh, regional organizations uh, in the name of EGAD and East African Community. And in fact, there was a discussion that EGAD and East African Community merge uh, to form a bigger uh, block. So we didn't make much, much progress, but that discussion has always been on. But now from the question you ask and the, and the discussion that has been going on, uh, in my view, it is legitimate for countries to, depending on, on what specifically they require for each other, have their own internal uh, bilateral or trilateral. However, <clears throat> if you look at the current structures of each of these countries, you look at the economies of these countries, you look at uh, the geopolitics, uh, you can tell clearly that um, at the end of the day, definitely uh, IGAD is going to be much more stronger. So I, I really do not see any um, uh, dent in the future of IGAD. I see that it's going to be uh, much more stronger because as some of these discussions go on, the relevance of IGAD and what it can, it can do uh, will, will be much more clear uh, to probably some of the political discussions right now. Ambassador, thanks for coming on the podcast. We look forward to speaking with you again in the future. It's a privilege and I thank you so much and I'm available. Of course, uh, when you leave an office, the, the, the best you can do is... Uh, you know, tell me what you know. Thanks all for listening and for bearing with us as we all record ourselves remotely. We will be back next week with another episode of our special COVID-19 coverage. If there's anything you'd like us to cover during this time, you can find me on Twitter at Alan Boswell. The Horn is a production of International Crisis Group. You can read our reports at crisisgroup.org. 
This episode was produced by Mae Francis. 